My name is Joseph Lorena, Periata Products. Um, what do we have? We have uh, a series of plastics that actually float onto water, bind metals, cer certain metals, and then sink. And that's, that's our overall technology. The plastics have very, very interesting properties. They don't bind sodium, calcium, magnesium. So we can find the needle within, within the haystack, if you will. Um, having that, we also um, used the properties to make a series of um, um, extraction solutions, leaching, leaching solutions, that will, you can wash solids, soils or wastes, with these solutions, and then, and, and then the plastics can easily pull them out. So why am I here? Well, about a year and a half ago, the Phosphate Institute um, gave us a grant to look at pulling rare earth elements out of, out, of, um, out of the phosphate waste products. And the results were actually, um, actually presented about two weeks ago, and we're able to pull out the rare earth elements out of the waste products in a yields of about was, um, 60 to about 70%. Uh, prior to this, they were able to pull it out at about five or ten or so percent. Um, so, if you then can open up the phosphate waste products as a source for for um, the rare earth elements, you can. There's a there is a lot of phosphate ore mined, and you can look at about a hundred thousand uh, tons of of the rare earth elements in the waste globally. So it's a huge potential market. Can you explain a little bit more about the technology and where you're on the patent application process? Okay, the company currently has four four separate U.S. patents uh, for for both the um, for both the synthesis of of the family. Um, they have, if you will, claws, so we can we can move the claws around to bind bind various metals. Um, we also have other other kinds of patents patents for the uses. So we have four four granted U.S. patents, mm -hmm. 22 international patents. Mm -hmm. um, we have three separate patent applications in the U.S., and we have a couple of PCTs uh, outstanding in that. How are you organized right now? Are you a private company, public company? Uh, we, are, we, are a, we are a private company, uh, a C-Corp, Inc. Um, we uh, were actually founded in 2009. Uh, we have been funded um, through some of grants, but uh, I would say friends and family. Mm -hmm. um, we've raised about 4.5 million dollars to date. Uh, company is sitting with uh, basically zero debt on the books. And uh, the goal of our company is not to become going into mining or going into any really industry. We actually develop intellectual property. And that's what we do, and that's what we're going to, going to basically continue to do. So we find people out there in whatever market there is to partner with, and we want to apply technology that we actually have to whatever kind of problems you may have. And is it a license royalty kind of arrangement whereby yes. you will license the technology either exclusively or by sector to a participant who either then resells it or builds a solution? That is correct. <laughs> Any questions? Well, any questions? Mr. Dr. Lipton? <laughs> what, what's the cycle life? Uh, do you, you strip the plastic and then you reuse it, yes? Yes. What's the cycle he, asked, life? he asked what the cycle life was, and um, I'll, I'll actually answer that in two ways. One, uh, the, the first lot of the material was made in 2006, and we have we have samples of all the lots produced by then, or, or, or actually since then, and they all, in fact, bind the same amount through through uh, the metals, performance metals. Um, with with the Phosphate Institute project, they actually had us do cycles, pulling the metal on and off. We were up to 10 cycles, and we saw zero zero loss so we can pull on and off relatively quickly the next the next phase of grants is actually to look at if uh, we can actually go to 20 or 30 cycles and then to actually recycle the leach solution so that it can be basically closed closed loop okay. system one more question let's say um, 
obviously the surface area of your plastics are very important here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I assume you extruded or, or a ribbon or, or, or beads, something like that? Um, the form right now is actually a powder. Okay. Plastic, uh, okay. an average kind of size to 200, 250 micron size. Um, so it's fairly large. Uh, we do have a program looking into um, looking into extruding it in terms of other kinds of forms. I'm trying to think of a, of a metric here uh, to describe. What I want to know is if I have X volume of plastic, uh, what uh, density, how much metal do I recover per unit? Excellent question. Um, ion exchange, you typically look at about five, five or so percent. Okay. We bind up to the weight. So okay. you're looking at um, and when you say 50 to 100 percent, you, you said phosphate. Do you mean, for example, from phosphate mining? Yes. Okay. So from from the phosphate mining industry, they will actually pull out. And I don't want to do too much chemistry here, but the phosphate's the negative part, mm -hmm. and and the calcium the are are actually the positive part. So what they do is they actually go go through separations of the waste clay. Um, the amine tails, the phosphogypsum, to get to the phos acid. The phos acid actually has about 13% rare earths reporting to it. The rest of it is actually lost in, in the process. So we looked at all of those waste streams, if you will, and annually you're looking at about 100,000 tons annually, not even going into the stockpiles of the waste clay or the phosphogypsum or anything else that is there. Uh, typically, those are light where it's, you're finding the phosphorus. Um, the monazite that we've looked at in Florida is about 50% uh, light, 25, 28% okay, well, heavy. Yeah, okay, that, that's true. Any other questions or any questions? Up, oh, here we go. Three. Yes, uh, I had uh, two questions. Uh, is What is the, um, the functional group on the plastic? Do you have a functional group that you add? that uh, tracks the metals to it. And then secondly, does that um, plastic material uh, pick up all the uh, rare earths together or does it pick up separate ones for, you have different plastic materials for each you know, separate rare earth element? Um, the group that we use um, is actually, actually a carbonate group. Um, and the, the plastic is actually composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Does not have sulfur, phosphorus, um, uh, sulfur, sulfur, phosphorus, phosphorus, nitrogen. So you can actually burn the plastic if you want, um, if the metal is really, really valuable and you produce CO2 and H2O. Um, you, you won't have any SOXs or NOXs produced uh, through actually the burning of that. Um, the actual technology is, uh, patented technology is, is twofold. One, um, because we're able to make the monomers different sizes, we have the groups that I'm using my hands to represent that as being, being the binding groups. And we can move those binding groups around within the monomer unit and then of course between the monomer units. So with, within there we have two, two separate binding sites. And except for the, um, for the carbonyl group, there's total flexible, flexible freedom of the rest of the polymer molecule, which has these huge hydrocarbon chains, which give it the ability not to actually, actually, actually dissolve in the water. But what happens is it attracts the metal, but because of the size of the claws, it can actually bind certain metals and, and yeah. actually not others. But then it's very fast, second order kinetics. And that's because it can actually engulf the material, which so you actually see it float it on, on the water with the metal, and it actually snows through and binds the metal going down. It actually engulfs that metal going down. Yes. So the second part of your question is, do we bind all, all the 17, the 15 plus two rare earths? Right. The, answer is, the answer is yes. So where do we fit in this technology? We're not, we're not the technology to actually separate the rare earths. We're there to get the rare earths out of the mess mm -hmm. so that you can actually separate them. So if you have a tailing pond that has rare earths that you can't get out with conventional ion exchange, call me. Okay, how about the uranium and thorium? Does it reject those? And 
or no. bind to those? It binds those okay. also. So that will pick those up together. So okay. we're looking at ways to use those, and there is interest in actually taking those thorium being, in fact, the uranium of the future in terms of being green. You had two more questions. You want me to proceed? Uh, it was Yeah, so I heard that you said the plastic floats and then sinks. Is the sinking a function of binding and becoming denser and going down? Yes. Okay, then um, can your binding agent sink uh, bind to nano gases? We haven't we haven't really looked at that. And if it did, then it wouldn't sink because it wouldn't have the density. And in, in every well, uh, the density of of the plastic is 0.99. It was actually designed that way. So it doesn't take much to have it sink and in all of the studies we've done on it since 2009, we've never had a problem having it sink to the bottom. And even if it doesn't, we can filter it. And how do we filter it in the lab? We use a coffee filter. Okay, great. So you don't need to do RO type systems cool, cool. to get this stuff out. Uh, I understood that you you made the feasibility uh, demonstration a few weeks ago, is it correct? Yep. Um, I actually presented at the, uh, the mining conference, yes. Okay. I also understood that the rears would be fixed in the plastic, and you said if you are interested in what you collect, then you would burn it. So that means that the plastic is a consumable, and can you give us an idea of what's the price of a plastic? If it's one kilo of plastic, as I understood, for one kilo of rears, and if I need to burn one kilo of plastic for each kilogram of rears, then there is a cost here, which is one kilo of plastic. So how much is the cost around? Okay, I would not actually, actually recommend burning I'm not it. asking for a commercial okay. proposal, but right. No, 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 I, and, and I, I'm going to yeah. say that um, for the rare earth metals, unless you're looking at um, some of the, the, the ones that are, that are higher priced, um, the process is you have you have the production cost so you have to put this into the matrix right as to whether or not it's cheaper to extract and reuse or it's cheaper to to actually burn it off to get to the metal um, in the rare earth um, industry we felt it was it was important to be able to recycle the polymers um, because of the fact that we want to get the production cost down to below about six or so dollars a kilo we feel that if we can get your product, your kind of extraction, front end extraction cost down to that amount, that kind of no matter what happens in the marketplace, it will still be a viable way to run. Now, what we don't have, because this market always changes, right? Well, what we don't have is we don't have the mining costs. We, we don't have to purchase the land. We don't have to permit it. We don't have to put the trees back and, and everything else. We get the waste products. So the front end costs aren't really there. We have one more. Right here. In the phosphate business, uh, as you know, I think uh, you mine the phosphate rock. Uh, you process it in flotation cells. You, you recover the phosphate ore, which is called matrix. Um, then you deslime it, and then the slimes go to a settling area. And then, uh, so now you've got your purified phosphate rock, which then goes to a chemical plant. You acidulate it with sulfuric acid, and then you produce phosphoric acid and phosphogypsum, which goes to the stack. Correct. Now, I think what you're saying is your technology can recover the rare earths from the slimes, also from the phosphogypsum and also from the phosphoric acid. Is that correct? Okay. Um, excellent question. Uh, yes and no. So let me, let me go through each of the steps. Um, the phosphoric acid, if we could get samples of the phosphoric acid, we did actually get samples. Mosaic gave us samples of the phosphoric acid. If we were able to get into the stream, the answer is potentially yes. And I know FIPPER, which is, which is the Phosphate Institute, has been looking and, in fact, doing that. That's fruit that's hanging way up there. I'm looking for something easy, right, starting off. The easiest thing is to do the leachates out, out of the phosphogypsum stacks, because the phosphogypsum stacks are going to have significant amounts of earth elements. 
you're not going to want to mine the stacks because you have to be able to stack it and you don't want to blast it to get it up. You can't touch the stacks. But what happens is the processed water, for those of you that don't know the industry, the processed water goes up to the top of the stack and percolates, leaches through, and they have moats around these ponds. Well, that pond is filled with rare earth elements. We can simply do a pump and treat, if you will, type of process where we go through our filters coated with plastics and we can pull this out without having to do anything. Okay, so that's actually the easiest. The second thing um, are, are actually amine tailings. We can actually leach the rare earth elements out of the amine tails. And then of course the waste clay, which is the first product that they get rid of before they, when they start sizing. 40% of the rare earth elements within that phosphate ore are actually sitting in the waste clay. So we want to get that clay before it settles because when it settles, it's not very easy to work with. So this is where the process engineering comes in and that's really what we're doing as a next phase. We're actually working, working with process engineers to take the technology that we have and to efficiently implement it into an industry that had never heard of us before. Just one more follow-up if, if it's okay. Sure. sure. <laughs> Um, what are your recoveries uh, of, of rare earths in the slimes? What are your recoveries in the phosphogypsum? Okay. Um, we have to bring the pH of whatever solution it is up to one, one and a half. So the pond water is about one and a half. If you leach the phosphate rock, you get a, a, a pH of about 0.7, so we have to bring the pH up. All of the metals that sit in that water at that pH are bound by, by the plastic. So the plastic binds 100% quantitative binding of whatever rare earth metals are left in that water at that pH. Extraction solutions, which isn't in fact optimized, so we didn't optimize for size, we didn't do any of that. Temperature was, was basically matched up from temperature studies. We were able to isolate, to actually extract 50 to the lowest was 50 to about 75 percent and it varies so for example uh, amine tails scandium was about 75 percent overall yield so it, it varies for the different for the different rare earth elements so well we still have some work to do in that process but what we're doing is we're looking for um, we're looking for partners to do that do you, do you gang it do you like okay 75 percent one pass do you do another pass, another pass, another pass? No, because we, well, in, in terms of extraction, in terms of, um, we haven't looked at, we haven't looked at serial extraction, we haven't looked at any kind of conveyor belt extraction. Isn't it mm -hmm. likely you can increase the yield dramatically? Absolutely. So okay. we can't, we, you know, the binding's there, we just have to increase extraction. Okay. And that's where, and that's why we're going, we're going to, to the process engineers to do this because we feel that if we can get that up even higher, it's be even better technology. But Joe, you believe it would be exponential, not incremental. Every time you ran into the circuit, to speak to Jack's question, you would see a somewhat similar amount of recovery? Yes. Wow. Okay. Any other questions? Um, we have been growing the list of the metals that we actually bind and that we don't bind depending upon the partners that actually come to us. So people send us samples, they call us and say, we have this material we'd like to separate. Can you bind it? And so we, we then take it in and we run, run it through the profile within our laboratory and we come back and say, yes, we can, no, we can't. What's interesting is that depending upon the form of that metal into the environment, it, in one form we may not be able to bind it and another we can. So if you look at coal ash, for example, we're able to bind arsenic out of the coal ash, uh -huh. but in other forms of arsenic and other kinds of oxide forms, we cannot. So it's important that we get some of your material and happy to do that and test it. And we'll come back to you and say, yes, we have this polymer that combine this and you tell us kind of what you're looking for.